good evening. I'm Jabari Morris, and this is MMT Mondays. Tonight's episode addresses how subsidies at different levels of government are used by the rich and corporations to make themselves richer at the expense of everyone else. Most people don't even know how many of the major businesses and industries in the United States earning billions of dollars a year draw upon government assistance to stay profitable from year to year. This term is called corporate welfare and is used by the rich in the establishment on Capitol Hill. Make sure to hit the like the subscribe buttons below and let's get to it. This first video explains how subsidies work at different levels of government. A subsidy is basically a sum of money that the state gives to people from a certain industry to keep the price of the product or service they're selling lower than it would have normally been. Let's assume it costs Bill $10 to produce a hat, whereas someone from China can do it for just $5. In this case, a $6 per hat subsidy from Uncle Sam can help Bill all of a sudden produce hats cheaper than the Chinese. In some cases, subsidies benefit society as a whole. For example, by encouraging people to develop new technologies such as solar or wind energy, or by encouraging NASA to explore the universe. In a lot of other cases, however, they do more harm than good. For example, producing cotton would normally not be all that profitable in the United States because the costs are higher than in less developed countries. The U.S. therefore heavily subsidizes this industry at the expense of people from some of the poorest parts of the world, in some cases, who are not able to compete. Brazil, for example, got upset and took this matter to the World Trade Organization. The result? Well, the U.S. is now subsidizing Brazilian cotton producers as well, instead of rethinking their entire cotton subsidy approach. But what should poorer countries, such as West African ones, do in this case? Countries which don't have Brazil's influence and negotiation power. With the help of these subsidies, you would think corporations receiving them would make it a point to pass these benefits on to their workers in the form of fair wages, right? This clip from Steve Grumbine's interview on Status Quo shows us how the race to the bottom using tax subsidies in states is destroying parts of the country. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that we understand that what happens with the states, look at Texas, look at Kansas. These places have raised the flag and said, come on down here to us. We'll cut your taxes to zero. We'll give away the farm. You just come on, bring your business. So these these other states like Flint, Michigan and Michigan, where they had you know, all the uh, automobiles made and, and various other Rust Belt areas, the businesses have been sucked out of there. They've either been uh, moved out of the country or they've been moved to one of these states that have dropped the bottom of the tax rate. And the race to the bottom is very real. So I think that part of our problem here is that as a nation, we have created an environment where we don't understand that states are currency users, the federal government is a currency issuer, similar to the EU with Greece and so forth. And let me ask you, because, you know, originally we were talking about MMT focuses on is there going to be enough people producing the goods and services? Well, a big reason why, there, why uh, that could be an issue is when the government lets corporations write trade deals and then people in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, the South, Southwest, North, everywhere uh, lose their jobs to Mexico, China and what have you. Uh, that ain't changing anytime soon. The Democrats give this lip service. Well, we just got to retrain people for the jobs of tomorrow. Well, I've talked to labor members and, and union members who did retrain. Unfortunately, there was no jobs in no. what they retrained for. So how do you have uh, enough people with the baby boomers retiring, all that, if the jobs are being offshored? Now you have automation. I mean, you, you walk into the movie theaters now, there's no tellers anymore. You walk into CVS, you, you know, there's no tellers. You just pay by machine. Uh, what is MMT's answer for that? So let's start with the Green New Deal to begin with. The Green New Deal in and of itself is going to require so much labor to be able to do a World War II level, you know, Marshall Plan mobilization that I would expect we would be welcoming immigrants into this country as opposed to pushing them out because we're going to need the labor just to retrofit and do all this stuff. Now, I will tell you, one of the concerns I have is that this Green New Deal, when they talk about a job guarantee, that job guarantee is not the same thing as having really, really good green jobs. The federal government can afford to pay really, really high-end 
career level positions in really incredibly technical, um, renewable, green type uh, sciences, you name it. So the the job guarantee, which I told you is the wage floor, should not be conflated for the jobs guarantee for a Green New Deal. We've got to have both. We've got to have those really high-skilled positions, and then we've got to have an opportunity for people to do things that are carbon-neutral kind of work in their community. So we could be fixing Puerto Rico. We could be fixing Flint. We could be fixing all these folks in a moment's notice. And the jobs, by putting a job guarantee in place, will give those areas the much-needed revenue they need to get back on their feet mm-hmm. um, and, and lure business back. Because, man, who doesn't want to you know, have a business in a place where people have money to spend? Right. So it, it only makes sense. It, you know, I think that's the answer is that you know, we, we suddenly revive these communities with a job guarantee. Think about what a pr- participatory local political area would look like now that they can choose what jobs they want to compensate. Everybody would want to contribute to their local political structure. Everybody would be involved in the town square. Everybody would care again about what's going on in their local community because there's value in being present. I mean, to me, this is a win-win-win for democracy, for everyone. It's just a beautiful thing. I am Primapil of RT America and Kevin Gustafson discuss how Elon Musk has gained the system by using government subsidies and capitalism in general to create his wealth. According to Real Clear Policy, of SpaceX's total $12 billion in contracts, $5.5 billion comes from NASA and the Air Force. And that's despite the fact a government audit revealed this year that the company, quote, is raising the price it charges NASA to launch cargo into space by roughly 50 percent. Tesla is thriving thanks to government subsidies designed to encourage environmentally conscious travel. Shoppers wealthy enough to even consider purchasing a Tesla automobile are offered enticing federal tax credits, $7,500 in subsidies, with states contributing even more. Overall, the LA Times reported in 2015 that Tesla owners received a total of $284 million, meaning the high cost of these luxury vehicles purchased by the well-to-do in society have actually been subsidized. The same is true for Musk's Solar City venture, considering the federal government offers a 30% tax credit for the cost of installing a solar energy system. The enterprise is yet another example of how Musk figured out how to game government incentives to rake in cash. And he's done well for himself, amassing an estimated net worth of $23 billion. As for the three companies which contribute to Musk's wealth, the LA Times reported three years ago that, quote, Tesla, SolarCity, and SpaceX together have benefited from an estimated $4.9 billion in government support, underscoring a common theme running through his emerging empire, a public-private financing model underpinning long-shot startups. With Elon Musk's wealth in question, we're joined now by Kevin Gustafson, an organizer with Democracy at Work DC. All right, Kevin, there's kind of this myth of the good billionaire, and Elon Elon Musk is one of the individuals constantly brought up to kind of fulfill that model. You know, they talk about how he doesn't take a salary at Tesla and how all of his companies are super innovative. Where does his wealth actually come from? Um, But the way he's basically become the, the person that he is is by doing what Silicon Valley entrepreneurs do. They come up with an idea that is a small piece of a market that they know that they could exploit start the company by getting investors to to give initial startup capital employ people at low wages so that they can because they're a startup and they they can't you know be at scale and then uh, leverage that to be able to in the modern like late stage finance monopoly capitalism find some big player who's able to to finally let you realize the profits that you've been gaining basically off the backs of your employees Mm. so while Elon Musk maybe not taking any money from Tesla now he has said that once it gets to a certain point he will start taking money and it's clear that these companies wouldn't even be making the money they are now without government support so it's kind of a myth to view them as totally private companies but people will still say look he's a genius improving solar uh, panel technology electric cars uh, the space program these are all things we should celebrate and he deserves the money what do you say to that well and there is some truth to that I wouldn't say that that's totally not not the case the the fact of the matter is that space SpaceX Tesla solar city these are new not necessarily new markets but markets that needed 
a kind of person to, to shake it up and to make these a, a viable thing. But the thing is that that isn't just coming out of a development to, in the sort of natural market. This is a market that's highly regulated. It's highly uh, influenced by government actors. And so you hear libertarians, in which Silicon Valley is full of, complaining that this is you know not really capitalism, it's crony capitalism, something like that. What I think Elon Musk has really done is, is base, and he's admitted this, saying, that's fine with me. I'll take, I'll take the money where I can find it. And if the government has it, take advantage of all of these different uh, government handouts. So, you know, you mentioned uh, with, with Tesla giving the rebates for people who can buy them, which are usually well-to-do people. SpaceX has leveraged uh, the ability, like they have a uh, launch facility and a testing facility in Texas. They got tens of millions of dollars in support to do that. They don't pay um, in income taxes in Texas and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there are decisions that he's making that are that specifically where they're going to be and what they're going to do is because there's money coming, not from the private market, though there is some coming from that, but definitely from the federal government. There's another issue here, though, which is the question of how workers for these companies are treated because there's, there's there's wealth being produced and coming in uh, but by, by these workers, but there have been issues at, at Tesla, for example, in the way you know, benefits and, and, and overtime are, are handled. What can you tell us about that? So the, the main theme of working for an Elon Musk company is essentially expect long hours, hard work, dangerous conditions, and not very good pay. Finally, this video shows how fossil fuel companies are gaming the system in a way that costs lives. The fossil fuel business in the U.S. is being subsidized by the federal government. It's succeeding in part because of the support of the government. If we took those subsidies away, the economic calculus would be very different. Today, based on the pollution that is being produced by fossil fuel companies and industries, thousands of Americans are dying every year. Globally, it's the numbers in the millions. And we are doing that for the benefit of the owners of those fossil fuel companies and almost no one else. We are subsidizing those companies so the executives and investors can make money at the cost of the health and well-being of the people of this country who are suffering already and will suffer much more intensely in the decades ahead if we don't change course right now. Globally, we are subsidizing the fossil fuel business to the tune of $5.3 trillion a year. Most of those subsidies have to do with the fact that the price does not yet adequately reflect the environmental cost of these fuels. If we had a price that did adequately reflect that, I think that that would go quite a long way towards changing the incentive structure of companies like, say, Exxon or Shell. I think some of them are sort of advocating imposing a carbon tax as a kind of trade-off in a bargain in which they would receive immunity from future liability lawsuits. And I think that reflects a kind of cold-eyed calculation of what they think is coming for them politically in the decades ahead as we understand just how damaging their product has been to the public health of the planet over the last few decades and will be even more so in the decades ahead. I think history will render a very brutal verdict on fossil fuel companies, in particular, you know, Exxon and Shell, I also think has had a long history of denial, um, funding disinformation, funding inertia on climate. I think they will be seen in much worse light than say the cigarette companies are today. Their behavior in the marketplace, their behavior in searching out new reserves to use in the future is practically speaking, suicidal, and I don't just mean that for them as companies, I mean that for us as a planet and as a species. We can clearly see how the rich and big corporations are using government subsidies to create mass amount of wealth for themselves at everyone else's expense. We should fight for policies that benefit the masses instead of just a few. If you enjoyed tonight's video, Make sure to check us out at realprogressives.org and subscribe to get notifications on new video streams in YouTube, Periscope, Twitch, Facebook, and Rockfin. Thank you and continue learning.